Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. First of all, let me, let me clear the record on a couple things. I have nothing against the University of Georgia. You've got to have some place for people that can't get into the University of Florida to go to college. <laughs> and uh, as far as Charlie Crist is concerned, I, sometimes I feel, you know, I don't know if you know this, but he's now a Democrat. He ran as an independent, now as a Democrat. But a few weeks ago, he announced that he's interested in potentially traveling to Cuba. Yeah, so there might be another party change yet ahead. Um, so we'll see. But <laughs> I'm really honored to be with you here tonight, or today, or this afternoon at this event, and for what all of you guys do at home uh, for the cause of our faith and, and our freedom and how those two things are combined. Let, let me begin by telling you the story, a little bit of my own family. Ralph talked about it a little bit a moment ago, but I think we all come from where we come from. We're all deeply influenced by our backgrounds and the people who help shape us. And I'll turn to that at the end of my speech to highlight the importance of that in today's America. My grandfather was born in 1899 at the turn of the century in rural Cuba. He was one of 12 or 13 children uh, raised in a, in, a, in a rural area to a farming family. When he was six years old, he had polio. So he lost the use of one of his legs. He was left disabled permanently. He couldn't work the farm. So his parents sent him away to school because that was the only chance he could even have to get ahead. And he learned to read and he learned to write and uh, he became educated. By the way, he was the only member of his family who knew how to read. When he left school, he went to work at a cigar factory. What he would do is he would sit in the front of the room while the workers were rolling their cigars, and he would read to them, first the newspapers and then a novel, and then when he was done, he would sit at the tables and roll cigars himself. A few years after that, he went to work at a, at a railroad station. He actually ran the station. And life was not bad by the standards of early 20th century Cuba. And then one day, he lost his job. Overnight, he lost it to someone who had a political connection, someone who was connected to power and politics, and life was never the same for them again. Life in early 20th century Cuba, as it would have been almost anywhere in the world, was hard for a disabled man to provide for his seven daughters. He wound up in Havana, Cuba, fixing shoes in a little space he rented out in a barber shop before finally having the opportunity to come here to the United States. Years later, my grandfather was like my best friend growing up. He lived with us in our home, and I would send, spend countless hours on the porch of our home listening to him tell me stories about all the things he learned as he read those newspapers and those novels and years since, about history and politics. One day it was about the Cuban Revolution, and the next day it was about World War II. But putting all of that aside, the most important lesson that my grandfather left with me is one that's shaped everything I've done since. The notion that I would have chances to do things he never had the chance to do. You see, my grandfather was born like almost anyone who's ever lived on earth, into a society where your future was determined by the circumstances of your birth. If you were born to a rich family with political connections, you too could get ahead. But if you were born to a poor family with no access to power, then your future was usually very limited. But what he wanted me to fully understand is that I was born in one of the few places in human history where that was not true. It was, beyond anything else, the lesson that he wanted to leave with me. And I'll never forget that on the day that he died, as he slipped away into a coma, I, I held his hand, I grabbed his hand, and I told him. I don't remember the exact words, but I basically let him to understand that I was not going to let the opportunities that I had go to waste. And even as he slipped away, I remember him squeezing my hand as if to say, that's exactly what I wanted you to know. The reason why I say this to you is not simply to make us feel good about me or you or about our country in general, but because it reminds us of what makes us special and different as Americans and as a nation. The reason why America is special and what defines us as a people and as a nation is the idea that anyone from anywhere can accomplish anything here because we believe that every human being born anywhere on earth has a God-given right, not a law-given right, a God-given right to go as far as their talent and their work will take them. Our founding says that we all have a God-given right to life, to liberty, and to pursue happiness. And we've put in place a limited government political system and a free enterprise economic system that has made that possible here more than any other place in all of history. The problem we face now is that there are mil millions of Americans that don't think that's true anymore. They feel as if that dream of equality of opportunity is slipping away. 
And the irony of it is that the people in charge in the White House today actually ran on the promise of helping people like that. And yet by every conceivable measure, people who are trying to get ahead are worse off today than they were six years ago. Why is these things happening? Well, one is because the, er the world around us has radically changed. The nature of our economy has changed. A moment ago, you heard from a great reformer, Mike Lee, my colleague with whom I work closely on, and on many of these issues. Our economy is different. We used to have a national economy. Now it's a global one. Our competition is often halfway around the world, not halfway across town. And you see the jobs that have slipped away because of automation and because of outsourcing. We also see challenges in the fact that all the better paying jobs of the 21st century require a higher level of skill or education, and many of our people haven't acquired it. But you also see an erosion in the values that have made our economy and our people strong. You can't have a strong country without strong people, and you can't have strong people without strong values. The world around us has changed, and yet our laws, our government, and our institutions have changed with them. They are relics of the 20th century. The policies of this administration aren't just wrong. They are relics of an age that's come and gone. For them, every single problem that I just mentioned to you has a government-sponsored solution. They think the economy will grow if we borrow more money and spend government money into it. They think they can educate more people by simply pouring more money into an outdated and broken educational system. And they completely ignore the importance of families and values in our society, thinking that instead those things can be replaced by laws and government programs. The good news is that we still have time to reclaim the American dream, to restore it, to help it reach more people than ever before. But to do so, we must do what Mike Lee just talked about. We must give our nation a 21st century reform agenda that re-embraces our founding principles of free enterprise and limited government, but applies them to the challenges of the 21st century. And there are three simple goals that we need to lay out. The first is we need an economy that will create millions of higher paying jobs. And those higher paying jobs are created as a function of one of two things, innovation or investment. Someone builds and creates something new, or someone takes money they have access to and they risk it to start a business or grow an existing one. We have to make America the best place in the world to invest and innovate. Right now, we are no longer the best place to invest because our, our tax code is among the most complicated and expensive on the planet. And other countries are targeting investment away from us. They brag about how their tax code is better than ours. The, second thing that the other thing that's holding back innovation is runaway regulations. And here's the dirty secret about runaway regulations. Some of the strongest supporters of big regulations are established industries, big companies, big corporations, and status quo industries who use regulations to prevent competitors from ever existing. Imagine for a moment if Blockbuster Video had successfully convinced the federal government to pass a law that required that in order to rent a movie, you must go to a retail outlet to rent a video cassette or a CD because in their head it would be a way to protect children from watching rated R movies. If they had ever come up and be able to pass a law like that, we would never have had the ability to download streaming video like we do today. It's not outside the realm of the imagination to see a law like this being proposed in another industry. But time and again, and we have seen established industries use our laws and our regulations to protect themselves against competitors. Of course a big company may not mind big government. They can afford lawyers and lobbyists. But if you are trying to start a business out of the spare bedroom of your home, you can't afford lawyers and lobbyists. And by the way, you probably are violating the zoning code. <laughs> the second thing we need is a modern 21st century education system, one that gives people the skills they need for the higher paying jobs of the 21st century. What does that mean? Number one, we have to stop stigmatizing career education. In this country, we still need welders and plumbers and electricians and airplane mechanics, and we should be able to graduate kids from high school with those skills so they can go to work right away and make it to the middle class and beyond. We need a higher education system that is available to people who have to work full-time and raise a family. If you are a single mother with two girls, you have to work full-time, you, you wake up in the morning, you make those girls breakfast. You drop them off and pick them up before daycare closes. You bring them home to make them dinner and do their homework. It's 11 o'clock at night and you are exhausted. 
And the only options available to you is our existing higher education cartel. An established higher education system that does not want to allow any competition. Now, these universities will offer online courses. Yes, they do. The online courses oftentimes are more expensive than sitting in the classroom. We need to provide a new form of higher education for people who have to work full time and raise a family so they can package learning wherever they acquired it, life experience, work experience, online coursework, often that is free, and some classroom work so that they can get a degree that allows them to get a better job. The receptionist needs to become a paralegal. The billing clerk needs to become an ultrasound technician. They will never be able to do that with our broken higher education system. Another example of an established industry, a higher education cartel that crowds out innovation and choices. And last but not least, the cost of higher education is completely out of control in America. I don't have time to get into all the solutions, but here's two that in my mind make sense. Number one, when a kid takes out a student loan, that university should be required to tell them, here's how much people that graduate from our school make when they graduate with the degree that you're seeking. So that the Greek philosophy majors will understand that the market for Greek philosophers is tight. <laughs> and the other is we need alternatives to student loans. Hey, I owed over 120 something thousand dollars in student loans. When I came to the Senate, I still had over hundred thousand dollars in student loans. We need to create alternatives to student loans, and I've proposed one. It's called the Student Investment Plan, and it allows you to go out and find someone that will invest in you, help you pay your higher education, and in return, you pay them back with a percentage of your income over a defined period of time. I encourage you to read the Wall Street Journal last weekend. It featured that idea and how it's been used in other countries to open higher education options for people all over the world. So the first two things we have to do is make America the best place in the world to invest and innovate, create millions of jobs, and give people access to the skills that they need. But here's the third thing we discussed. We must reinvigorate the role of values in our country. You see, I believe that you can have all the diplomas on the wall you want. If you don't have the values of hard work, discipline, and self-control, among others, you will not succeed. And the trick is that no one is born with these values. There is not a person in this room, in this country, or on this planet who was born with those values. Those values were taught to you, and they were reinforced. They were taught to you in strong homes, and they were reinforced by churches and synagogues and the community around you and by your family as well. And it is eroding all around us. The single greatest contributor to economic and educational underperformance in America today is the breakdown of families. The single greatest contributor to poverty in America today is the breakdown of families. By the way, I don't say this as a way of saying give up on the people that aren't in strong families. On the contrary, I say that as a way of saying we have to do everything we can to help people that are growing up in these challenged circumstances. Because all the government programs in the world will not help them overcome this unless something happens. And there's some things government can do. For example, we have to empower parents. It is unfair, it is immoral, it is un-American that in this country, poor people are the only ones who cannot choose where their children go to school. Every parent in America deserves the right to send their children to the school of their choice, not the school board's choice, and certainly not Washington's choice. We need to make family life keep up with the cost of living. And Mike Lee talked about pro-family tax reform, a, 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 a real health care reform, not the disaster that we have today, but one that allows families to buy the health insurance that they need at a price they can afford from any company in America that will sell it to them, no matter what state they're in. But the last point that I would make is, the last point I would make is, we have to talk about this. You see, in this country, we tell people all the time not to smoke because it causes cancer. And I have no problem with that. We tell people to be careful and not gain too much weight because it causes heart disease and diabetes. And I have no problem with that. But we also need to tell people it's important for you to keep your family together. It's important for you to be good parents. It's important for you to instill values in your children because you will struggle to succeed in this country and in this world if you do not. And too often we have too many leaders in both public and private life that will not do that because they are afraid to be seen as sitting in judgment of someone. 
but at least those of us who are inspired by Judeo-Christian values, we're not seeking to sit in judgment of anyone. But we know that there are fundamental truths proven through thousands of years of human history. And we have an obligation to our country and to our fellow man to use our positions of influence to highlight those values. And no matter how much we spend or reform education, no matter how attractive we make America economically, we cannot have a strong country without strong people. And we will never have strong people without strong values. And that's why I encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. I'll close by saying that I am not typically considered to be someone that came from a privileged background. At least if you believe the American dream is about how much money you make or how famous you become, that would be true. But I did come from a privileged background. You see, my parents both grew up poor as well. I told you about my mother's struggles because my grandfather, who struggled to raise them, that's where she grew up. My father, when he was nine years old, lost his mother and went to work and would work basically for the next 70 years. Both of my parents came to this country because it was the only place on earth where people had a chance at a better life. It wasn't easy here either. Here they never became famous or rich. My dad was a bartender. My mom was a cashier, a maid, a stock clerk. And yet my parents fully lived the American dream. They were able to find jobs that allowed them to make it into the American middle class. They were able to provide for their children a strong and stable home where we were loved and felt protected and safe and we were encouraged to dream. A home where our parents loved each other and they loved us. And they saw their children grow up to do all the things they never had a chance to do. I had the privilege to grow up in an environment like that. And all those things are an extraordinary advantage. I would rather live in a strong and stable home raised by loving parents than in a broken one raised by millionaires. And so I did come from a background of privilege. The greatest of all is to be a citizen of the one nation on earth where the son of a bartender and a maid could have the same dreams and the same future as the son of a president or a millionaire. Today, there are millions of people that seek the same for themselves and for their families. And whether America remains exceptional or not will be determined by whether those dreams become possible or not. If we ever become a nation where people like my parents can no longer get ahead, we will lose what makes us special. But if we return to the principles of our founding, to free enterprise, to limited government, to the notion and the reality that government is supposed to serve the people, not people serve the government, to the fundamental truths of strong values equal strong people, then we can reclaim the American dream. Then this 21st century can also be an American century. At the end of his life, my father never lived to see Election Day. But he did see me win a primary. On the day of my primary, he wanted desperately to make it to my event. He had been sick now for a number of months, had not gotten out of bed for weeks. And so I went to check in on him, check in, on him in the middle part of that day. My nephew opened the door. He lived with my sister at that point. He was smiling. I said, what are you smiling about? He said, come in, let me show you. So I walk into the back of the house, and my dad is sitting fully dressed, ready to go in his wheelchair. First time he had been out of bed in weeks, because he wanted to go to his son's victory party. Now, he was a proud father, as any father would be. But as I look back, I realize that he wanted to be there, not simply because he was proud of me, but because on that night, his life was affirmed. That all the sacrifices he made, that all the difficult decisions he had to make, that all those nights where he didn't feel like going to work because he was 69 and tired, but he did, it meant something. It, it had a purpose and a meaning. And what makes us special is that we are one of the few nations on earth where that story has been possible for millions of people, including almost every single one of you here today. What we are called to do in this generation is not just to preserve that, but to expand it to reach more people than it ever has. And I believe that we will. For in less than two years, we will have new leadership, God willing, in the White House and in both houses of Congress. And then we can do what every generation of Americans before us has done. Whatever it takes to ensure that our children inherit what we inherited. The single greatest nation in the history of all mankind. Thank you for the opportunity. God bless all of you. Thank you.